church family, service will begin shortly, but we want to share a few announcements before we start. First, if you're visiting in person today for the first time, we would love to know that. So on your way out, stop by our I'm New Wall, located in the lobby. We have a little gift for you. October on the Hill is in full swing. You may want to get your phone ready because we have a full calendar of events. The first is Pathways, scheduled for October 17th at 6 p.m. This is our on-ramp to connection with our community of changed lives. So if you're ready to take the next step, register today on our website, shelbychristian.org. As always, childcare and a meal is provided. Second is our marriage date night on Saturday, October 21st, starting at 5 p.m. There will be a hayride and cookout at the Howard Farm just a few minutes away from church. The cost is only $10 per couple and childcare is provided. You can register on the church website or scan the QR code on the screen. And ladies, here's some dates for you. Own It, which stands for Our Women's Network, is having a chili cook-off in the Common Grounds area on October 22nd. You can sign up on Facebook or text Kim at the number below. Save the date on April 12th and 13th. Jennifer Rothschild is coming to Lexington and Kim is looking for ladies to volunteer for this event. Also, there is early bird pricing available. Our annual Fall Family Fun Fest is happening October 25th right here on the Hill. Bring the kids out in their costumes and invite some friends for food, sweet treats, and more. This year's theme is all around the world. If you can volunteer to help with this event in any way, please sign up at the sign up wall in the back of the sanctuary. We also have a candy campaign going on to help provide all the candy needed for this event. So you can drop those donations off in the lobby bins or our church office. Jumpstart is our pathway to baptism for elementary age children and it's happening this Sunday at the 11 o'clock service. See Tiffany for details. The middle school fall retreat is happening October 22nd through the 29th. Our next big event on the hill for our uncommon ministry is November 4th at 8 a.m. for a country breakfast. Text Dave at the number below to register for this event. Open to all men and invite a friend. Hey, it's time to celebrate. We just hit 100 baptisms for the year. Addie, Cole, and Milo were all baptized Sunday morning and Jacob was our 100th baptized on Sunday night. Stuff happening around the hill. As you're standing to your feet, can you find somebody you don't know? Shake your hand, tell them. Glad you came into the house of the Lord today, right before we worship. Oh, 
We just have to sing hallelujah. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Come on my soul Come on my soul oh, Don't you get shy on me Lift up your soul Cause you got a lion
Can you pray with me? God, we thank you that you're faithful through generation after generation, God. Your love never fails us, God, even though we can sometimes fail you, Lord. You always come through, Lord. We love you. We thank you for what you're doing today in this church, in this body of believers. We thank you for the word that's going to be brought forth in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Am
Man, that was awesome worship. I love being down front, and I can hear you guys singing, and it is such an awesome, awesome experience. I'm so excited about what God's doing. I'm glad you guys are here today, but I need to make a confession to you. I know almost nothing about picking for antiques. I know it's a thing, but I don't know. I've never been antique shopping a day in my life. Just not been part of my schedule, my routine. I don't know anything about it. Here's what I do know, though. I do know that the greatest value in something that we would consider antique is if that, that thing, that piece of whatever that, if that, that you're looking for, if it's in its clo as close to possible original state, that's when it's got real value. And it's really the difference between reformation and restoration. See, here's the difference. Reformation is you've got this idea or a picture of this beautiful antique chair. And you find another chair, or you even just start from the beginning if you've got those skills, and you, you get on the, the lathe, and you do the poles and the spindles and all that, and you try to make something that looks like the original. That's reformation. You're reforming something to try to make it look like the original. You're starting over and trying to do that. But restoration... Restoration is when you take the original and if there's any flaws in it, you fix the flaws. You get it back and it's still the original. That's where true value is found. And, and we are a part of something called the restoration movement. Our church is. The idea was we're there 200 years ago. There were some people that were sick and tired of denominationalism because what they had found was, what had evolved in those churches was that in far too many cases, they were preaching the teachings of man, not the teachings of God. And they were focusing more on the denomination than on the Savior. And so they started this movement, and we're a part of it, it's a restoration movement of just trying to be as close to the Acts chapter 2 church as is humanly possible, trying to get rid of the flaws along the way. It's a really interesting quote that's attributed to Michelangelo. Michelangelo had carved the, the famous statue of David, and he was asked, did you have something in mind? And he said this, though, all I did was chip away everything that didn't look like David. So that was it. He wasn't trying to, it was just like, this is this vision of this man after God's own heart. And so he, he started chiseling, chiseled away everything that didn't seem like it should be David. Now understand, he didn't even start with like a man, he started with just a block, you know, and just chiseled away. Here's the good news. Here's some really good news. You know what God wants to do today? He wants to chisel away every part of you that doesn't look like Jesus and wants to restore you to the beautiful state that he created you in. Now, we're in this series talking about the road to recovery, stepping into freedom. And we've been talking the last week and this week about how this is by no means just for people that are in need of recovery from some kind of substance abuse addiction. Because that's where our mind automatically goes. So you recover, oh, those are, that's somebody that's like had, had an addiction to a substance. While that is true, while, while anybody that's in that world fits that, it's far bigger. It's a far bigger world than just alcohol, drugs, pills and needles and anything. It, it's, it's everything. Yeah, you throw in there the addiction to gambling, the addiction to pornography, the addiction to anything that you can imagine like that. But it's not just that. It's grief. It's depression. It's anything that has moved your bubble off center to where your, line, your life is not in alignment with the way that God created you to be. And here's the deal. We talked about it last week. Y'all remember bottom of page two? Some of you are here. Anybody remember what I'm talking about? Bottom of page two? That, that, and you, you open that book that's there underneath the seat in front of you. And I'm not even going to tell you the, the name of the book. And I'm not even going to tell you the, the chapter and verse. I'm just going to tell you. Go to the bottom of page two. And that's where you'll find that we all, every one of us, need recovery. 
Because even if you've never tasted a drink of alcohol or used any kind of illegal drug, watched anything on your computer screen, gambled on anything, even if you've never done any of that stuff, the Bible tells us this. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have a sin addiction that we all need to recover from. And the only way to recover from that is Jesus. The big difference in sobriety and recovery, it's Jesus. That's the difference maker. That's the difference maker in the whole equation. So in this series, our, our next checkpoint on the road to recovery is to find a way to have our sanity restored. Last week we talked about how, how the, the, we are, we're powerless and a lot of you, could, we, we talked a lot about that stuff. Well, this week in, in, in this next checkpoint on our road to recovery, it's understanding that we can get better. Understanding that there is a way out of our situation. Last week we had a lot of people that confessed privately, in some cases to their friends, Many came last week in our, in our various services, either over to the foot of the cross or the stage and just knelt and just privately confessed to God things that they're powerless over. Last week, there was, there was one situation where um, a husband and wife went over to the foot of the cross and prayed just that, okay, this is it. We got, something's got to change. Something's got to give. I'm powerless. And then God stepped in in a huge way. Because as soon as that service was over, uh, there, there, someone invited that, 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 that man to go and see the movie The Blind I'd talked about. And they went, and God began working. Another couple in the church invited that couple, and they got together and had dinner. And then the coolest thing in the world, in my mind as a pastor, the coolest thing in the world happened last Sunday night about 7 o'clock. Kim and I had been out somewhere, and we got back home, and we were kind of unwinding. She was in one room, and I was in another, and she yelled, did you just get a text? I said, yes, I just got a text. She'd gotten a text from a lady, and I got a text from her husband, and both their texts said the same thing. Hey, just want you guys to know, we're headed up to church to do a baptism right now. And that young man that was at the foot of the cross last week got baptized last Sunday night. You saw him on the screen. It was number 100. And, and, and I wasn't even here. I don't even know how Brett ended up in it, but somehow Brett was around. Other than that, there were no pastors on scene at all. It was just people. Here's what it was. It was one beggar showing another beggar where to find some bread. That's discipleship. That's discipleship. And, and the only way that happens is if we get in relationship with one another and we rub shoulders with one another. That doesn't happen when, when we've got our own little holy huddles in the church that we sit with every week of people that we know are died and go, are born again, died and going to heaven. It, it's getting those out of those holy, holy huddles and going to find people that are kneeling and praying and saying, hey, let me show you where to find some bread. Hmm. That's discipleship. In the original 12-step movements, A-A-N-A, and -A -A, walking through the 12 steps, here's what step number two says, all right? It says, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves, I'm powerless, I'm powerless, I can do nothing on my own, but we believe that there is a power that's greater than ourselves that could restore us to sanity. Here's a corresponding verse from the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul writing, for it is God. Let me stop just here for a second. Hear me say this correctly. I am 100% in support of almost everything that 12-step movements do. The problem is when Dr. Bill, Mr. Bob, all those, Mr. Bill, Dr. Bob, whatever. When they wrote these, you know what the, you know what the original step two said right here? We, the original step two said, we came to believe that God can restore us to our sanity. And then they tried to, that over the decades, they tried to soften it enough so that people who didn't believe in God could find help in 12 steps. I'm telling you what, the only thing that separates sobriety from recovery is God is Jesus. Don't tell me 
that a doorknob can be your higher power unless it can create the universe. That's what makes it a higher power. That's why God is the one who restores our sanity. Then you move into, into the road of recovery. Principle two in road of recovery says, earnestly believe that God exists and that I matter to him and that he, 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 no doorknob, he has the power to help me recover. And in Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount, here's what he said. Happy are those who mourn. What? That doesn't even sound like. Happy are those who mourn. They're mourning because they've realized they're powerless. They're mourning because whatever's going on in your life that makes you mourn, you realize I'm in a situation that I don't have any control over. I'm, I'm powerless. I'm mourning for they shall be comforted because it's when we mourn, when we realize that we have no power, that God can step in and comfort us. In the program that we run here, our community recovery program, we take all this and we just funnel it down to one word, restoration. Restoration. We start with powerless, and then we move to restoration. I want to be restored to the original God-given state. Kim said once, we are blessed to be a part of restoration, not reforming what man has corrupted, but restoring what God intended. That's what we're about. And to do that, we need to begin by acknowledging God's existence. There is a group that does research in, in Christian world and different things like that uh, that are all spiritual, biblical, those things. And the Pew Research Center estimates that between 4 and 5% of Americans consider themselves to be atheists. And another 4 to 5% consider themselves to be agnostic. Now, what's the difference? The American Psychological Association defines an atheist as someone who doesn't believe in a God, and they define an agnostic as someone who doesn't believe it's possible to know for sure that God exists. Therefore, atheism is about belief. Agnosticism is about knowledge. But here's the deal. If, or better said, when you hit rock bottom, where are you going to go find help? and hope. Here's what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Check this out. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Why in the world would you pray to a God that you're not sure exists, even if your plane is crashing? Acknowledge God's existence. Let me give you two really key words here, all right? Two really key words, but God, but God, but God, but God. Do you know that there's 58 times in the Bible that those two words are, are linked together in that way, but God. And they're so cool. It starts out, there's 11 times in the book of Genesis that that phrase, but God exists. And, and it's, it, so many of those times, it's like about, okay, God had creation, and then we got to the bottom of page two, and Satan had come and messed it up, and like the world was like in trouble and all this, but God, but God caused it to, to rain and build a boat, and eight people survived, but God started over again. And, and then there's other times in, in the book of Genesis where things were just really like messed up, whacked out, and God stepped in. There, there's a time when, the, you know, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and most of us know what was going on in those cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God says, I'm getting ready to destroy those cities because of the, the sin that's happening in those cities. And, and, and Abraham's brother Lot was in there, and he said, can you take care of Lot? And then we read in Genesis, but God spared Lot. We read about the time when when, uh, uh, when, when uh, oh gosh, I've just lost my, I'm going crazy here. Uh, we read about the time with Jacob. That's why I couldn't think of the name. Jacob, when Jacob's trying to get married because he's falling in love with Rachel because she's beautiful, she's gorgeous, and he goes to her father Laban and says, I, I, want, I want Rachel to be my wife. And, and, and Laban says, okay, here's the deal. If you'll work for me seven years, seven years, if you'll work my farm, my ranch, my whatever, if you'll work for seven years, you can have her. And so he does that. And he works hard. He does everything he's asked because he's in love. He wants her. And, and then there's this, this kind of like private ceremony thing where then they end up in the wedding tent together that night. <laughs> and then Jacob rolls over in the next one. Here's the problem with Leah, you know, that I'm sure she was a sweet girl. <laughs> Some of you have read this, and you know. You know, the Bible doesn't like call her like, ugly. 
The Bible says she was homely. <laughs> All right, whatever, all right? But then, and so, so that's what the Bible, and so then Jacob rolls over that next morning and he, he's expecting to see Rachel and he sees the winner of the Miss Homely Award and the father has switched him up and he's like, what are you doing, man? I did all this for all this. And, and, and he says, but, but in, 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 our, in our country, the oldest has to get married first. If you work seven more years, I'll give you my other daughter. That time, don't, don't worry at this point about more than one wife. That was part and that came later. But he's like, I'll give you the other daughter. And so Jacob does that. And through that whole time, he says, but God never let Laban harm me. But God, but God. Then you get over in the New Testament. You get over in the New Testament, the book of Acts, and it's not the creation of the world, and now it's the creation of the church, and the church is getting started. And, and, and why did the church get started? The church got started because Jesus came to earth and died for our sins, and then they killed him. But God did not see it fit for him to remain. In fact, in Acts 2, 24, it says, But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in, his gri in its grip. And in another place it says, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And then Saul's telling about his conversion experience. For the third time, he shares a story in Acts chapter 26. And he says, Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this, and they tried to kill me, but God, but God has protected me right up to this present time so I can testify. Hang on. So I can testify to everyone. God allowed me to get through that. God kept me alive so that I could be a testimony to others. I need your help next week. Next week, we're moving to step three. It's all about surrender. And we need to illustrate what that looks like for those who've maybe not yet been there. So next week, what I want to do is right before I come up to speak, we're going to do a new song we're going to introduce to you, and we're going to do some cardboard testimonies. Some of you have already read my email and volunteered to do it, but I need more, all right? Cardboard testimony is simple. On this side, you just take a Sharpie and you write your pre-state, whatever it was, whatever it was. And, and yeah, it, it could be, you know, something that's addictive, or it could be, I found out I had stage four cancer and had a month to live, but I'm still here. It's a but God moment. It's a but God moment. It, it may be the, the divorce papers had already been filed, but we're still together. It could be, I didn't think I would ever see my children again, but now they're living with me. Whatever, whatever, but God, but God. We've all got some but God moments. I, 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 at least I think we do. Anybody in here got a but God moment except me? All right. But God's going to allow you to start raising your head more and quit being bashful about it. Come on, church. You know, we... <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm off script now. Sorry, I'm off script. You know, there, there needs to be a place in time when if this stuff is real and the preacher says, anybody got a but God moment, there's none of this. There's people standing on their feet and yelling about it. That's what we need. Because as long as you're doing this, that part, what did Paul say? God has kept me alive so that I might testify to everyone. This isn't a testimony. I'm just saying, deal with it. I had lunch. This stuff is so serious. That's why I get passionate about it. I had lunch with a dear friend this week, and he was telling me how less than two years ago, there was a night that he had decided he had all he could take, and, and he was going to end it that night. He was headed up the steps to get his shotgun, and he was going to swallow the barrel, and it was going to be over. And as he started up, his st started up the steps to get the gun, his wife's chasing him, and, and he's trying to get away, and he kicks to get her away, and he reaches in the closet, and he grabs the gun, and he grabs the shell, and he puts it in, and it slides right out because he tried to put a 20-gauge and a 12-gauge, and it didn't work that way. But God, Amen. you see what's going on there? <clears throat> but God 
And, and then, then he got arrested because as in part of that process, when he kicked back, he accidentally hit his wife in the face. And, and when the police actually got there to the scene, she's bleeding from the face. And they asked her, what happened? He kicked me. Now it's a charge of felony assault. That's 10 years. That's 10 years. And so he finds himself in a jail cell, doesn't even make his call because he doesn't know who to call. And he's powerless. He's broken. He's lost it all. And the next morning, the guard knocks on the cell and says, hey, you got a phone call from your lawyer. And he's laying there in his cot thinking, I don't have a lawyer. I didn't call anybody. I don't know anybody. But, but, but that wonderful, sweet lady that had gotten kicked called and got a lawyer. And the lawyer got involved and through a whole bunch of things, it went from a felony charge to a misdemeanor charge to stay clean for six months and it'll all be gone. And today it's all gone. But God, but God, but God. See, those are the things that happen in life that we've got to testify to. We've got to testify to. Paul said in Romans chapter one, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. It's, it's there. It's there. And through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, so that they have no excuse in not knowing God. You know what David said? <laughs> David just called it, only fools say in their hearts there is no God. We've got to acknowledge God's existence if we're ever going to be restored. And part of believing in God, a God who can restore you to sanity, is being able to, when you're powerless, to be able to know his character. How do you, how do you know God's character? Here's what Paul told the Colossian church. I love this phrase. That, that it's the invisible expression. It's the visible expression of an invisible God. You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. Look at everything this tells us about Jesus. That's part of why Jesus came, so that he could live here, and that we could, but we could see God, that he came, and he became flesh, and he moved into the neighborhood, and he lived with us a while, so we could understand God's character. And understanding God's character starts with believing that God knows all about my situation. There's this, there's this, there's this definition, this, this big word, omniscient. Omniscient. It means all-knowing. Another one, omnipotent, means all-powerful. That we have an omniscient God who knows everything. <coughs> he doesn't cause everything. Stop right there. There's a difference between knowing and causing, okay? All right? He knows all things. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care. My buddy, when he was running up those steps in the middle of the night, God was not in heaven going, wow, I didn't see that coming. There's not a thing we've been through that God doesn't know, that God doesn't see, that God is not there waiting to help us if we simply call on him. God knows all about our situation. When you find yourself helpless and powerless, God's there. God's there in that moment. Do you believe that there is a God who can restore you to the sanity that you're in in that moment? God cares about my situation. God cares about my situation. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 6. Paul said, But when we were utterly helpless, we'll substitute the word powerless right there, same idea. But when we were utterly powerless, Christ came at just the right time, just the right time, and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good or who you're married to or who you brought into the world. Those people, maybe. But God, there it is again, Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You don't have to get the junk worked out. You don't have to stop cussing. You don't have to stop drinking. You don't have to stop sleeping around. You don't have to do all those stuff before, stop doing all that stuff before you accept Jesus. But I'm telling you, if you accept Jesus and let him into your heart, he'll help you stop doing those things. He'll change you. 
If you could change yourself, you don't need him. But you can't. And I can't. But he can. But God. The last thing we need to do is not only believe that he knows our situation and he cares about our situation, but that he can change my situation. Paul said, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe this is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Understand God's character. Acknowledge his existence. But here's the most important piece. If you want to be restored, you got to accept God's offer to help. I mean, there's this really old, old story, and I'm guessing probably at least half of you, if not more, have heard this story, so bear with me. It's, it's not even a true story. It's a made-up story, but it illustrates a great point. The story's told about a guy that's sitting on his roof. He lives next to the river, and the rain has been coming so much, and the waters in the river have started to rise, and they're all the way up. They're getting, he gets up on the roof because it's the only way he can escape, and he's sitting on the roof of his house as the water is rising, and he's praying for God to rescue him. Not very long, here comes a guy in a boat. Pulls right up to the roof, says, hop in. The guy says, no, 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 I'm good. God's going to rescue me. <laughs> Little later, helicopter comes flying over, drops one of those rope ladders down, says, the guy's yelling, down, hey, climb up, climb up. No, I'm good, I'm good. God's going to rescue me. Water keeps rising. Finally, the man drowns. Finds himself in heaven, standing before God, said, hey, why didn't you rescue me? And all God says is, who do you think sent the boat and the helicopter? Our problem is that when we're in those plane crash moments of prayer, we want something supernatural. We want a mar Marvel character to suddenly come flying in and appear. We want something that is almost extraterrestrial. It's so supernatural. And the reality is when we're up there and we're praying and God sends a boat and a helicopter, it's time to get off the roof. It's time to accept his, accept his, his offer. Paul told the people in the church at Philippi, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Here's what that means. Think, that, think this through. You're sitting on the roof, figuratively, and you're just praying for God to rescue you, and that boat shows up. Here's what you need to understand. Not only did God send the boat, his son Jesus Christ is the captain of that boat that he sent to rescue you. And that the whole time you're sitting there on the roof, that his Holy Spirit is there with you. He knows your situation. He's there with you. He's trying to provide a way out. Somebody needs to hear that today because somebody in here today is sitting on a roof praying for some kind of rescue and there's boats and there's helicopters all around and you just need to understand God cares and he's there and he's trying to restore you to a place of sanity in your life. Amen. The prophet Isaiah said, when you go through the deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. And when you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you won't be burned up. The flames won't consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, your Savior, the Holy One of Israel. There's a testimony that we need to share. Some of you need to share on a piece of cardboard. Here's the deal. If you don't already have my cell number, come see me as soon as service is over. I will give it to you. Make sure you have it in your phone. And if you do have it and you're willing to do this, just simply text me your name right now and put a TH for Thursday or an S1 for 930 Sunday morning or an S2 for, for, sun, uh, for 11 o'clock. I'll go ahead and tell you now. 502. Three, two, one, six, three, five, one. I don't care for anybody to have that. If you got a phone and don't want to give your number out, that's a different. That's that's something you probably need to be restored from. Uh, but anyway, guys, the bottom line is this: 
when this is all over. Slavery is going to be one of the biggest black marks on humanity in all of history. I don't care that we're, we're talking about American slavery in the South that was so detestable or the slavery that's still going on in parts of the world. Slavery is a horrible thing because it dehumanizes people and leaves them feeling powerless. But in the book of Genesis, we read about it. In the book of Genesis, there is a guy named Joseph. He's the youngest of a bunch of brothers who are jealous of him. And so to get rid of him, they, they capture him. They tear off his outer garment, his robe that his father had gotten. They cover it in blood, and they tell their father that Joseph was eaten by a wild animal. They had thrown him in a pit. They waited for the Midianites to come out. They sold him into slavery. How bad do things have to be to sell your brother into slavery? They sold him into slavery, and they took him away, and he went. But, but during that time there, Joseph just kept doing the right thing, and he, he kind of grew as a prisoner in, in Pharaoh's ranks to where he had a lot of authority. In so he grabbed his coat and accuses him of rape, and, he's, and by that time, Pharaoh's made him in charge of all the food. And he's been wise. He's been wise about it. He's been filling the barns. He's been stockpiling stuff. Just, when things were good, he was taking advantage of it. He was putting stuff away just in case there was a bad time. And now there's a bad time. And now everybody, everybody everywhere, all over the region needs food. And the only place to get it is to come Pharaoh. And not, it's really not even coming to Pharaoh. It's coming to Joseph, who's representing Pharaoh. And so here come those brothers to get food. And they get there. And, and they don't recognize him. I mean, a lot of years have passed. He recognizes them. If no other reason, there's 11 of them. He does the math really quick. He knows, like, well, this has got to be them. And so he starts playing some games with them and everything until finally he, he convinced them, if you, if you want food, you got to go back and get your dad and bring him back because Joseph wanted to see his dad. And he gets him back there, and then there's this awesome verse. There's this awesome verse that I want you to hang on to. It's in chapter 50, verse 20. In Genesis chapter 50, Verse 20, Joseph is finally telling his brothers what's going on here and that God has done these things to him. And he says this, what, what the evil one meant to destroy, God has turned around and used to the good. Some of you in here, no, all of us in here have been the target of destruction. Because Jesus himself said, that thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he wants to destroy you. But God wants to do something good through you. God wants to bring you out of the fire. God wants to bring you out of the, out of the terrible times in your life so that you can testify to him. Because we are all slaves to our own sin. And once we feel like that we are powerless and helpless and hopeless, then but God... But God steps in, and he loves us, and he wants to restore us into our rightful position. And so he gave us Jesus. It's time to get off the roof. Here's what Jesus said, John chapter 1. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. Not only did he want to save you, he wanted to make you children of God. That makes you a co-heir with Jesus. That makes you the worthy recipient of all that God has in store for you if you will simply admit that you're powerless and allow him to restore the sanity in your life. Just a moment, we're going to celebrate that. We're going to come in just a moment. Uh, when the music starts, we're going to come, and, and you can get your emblems for communion if you haven't already done that. Everybody needs to move because everybody needs that. If you haven't already given your tithes and offerings, and listen to me, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to slip, but we need that. Our tithes and offerings are our way of saying thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you that somebody before me gave so that the church or that somebody could tell me about you, that I could get to know you, and I just want to pay it forward. I just want to give in such a way so that the world can know, so that the people in these countries that are on our, on our catwalk, that they can know about Jesus, that the people that are in Guatemala that our crew just got back from, that they can know about Jesus. And so when we give, when we give, it's for that. And, and the Bible clearly says if we don't do that, now here's what the Bible says. If we don't tithe, we're robbing God. That's what the Bible says. I didn't make it up. Malachi 3.10, look it up. All right? So we need to move. We need to move and get our communion. We need to move and give. But here's the most important part. 
Some of you need to do what some did last week. And you need to move to the foot of the cross or the front of the stage. We cleared out all kinds. You need to move somewhere and you need to pray. And you need to get on your knees and you need to pray. It's hard to run from God when you're on your knees. And you need to pray for God to do something spectacular in your life because you're powerless. And then maybe, maybe, maybe. We, had, we showed you number 100. Spoiler alert, 101 happened Thursday night, just so, just so you know. All right? So maybe some of you need to meet Bobby or Jason up here at the steps by the baptistry, and you need to take care of that today. So as the lights come down, you're going to have it. Let's, let's get ready to move. God, thanks for moving. Thanks for moving Jesus from heaven to earth so that we could have hope, that we could have a possibility, that we could be restored to our rightful position, our God-designed, created position. And so, God, I pray as we move to commune, as we move to give, as we move to pray, and for some that they move to surrender to Jesus, that you would bless us right now. And we speak Jesus over this time. In his name we pray. Amen. Move to your emblems, but then hold them and we'll take them together. Your name is healing, your name is healing. 
second. It's time to celebrate, okay? We'll celebrate two ways today. This little piece of bread is a reminder that you don't have to do all the fighting alone in your own body because one used his body so that you wouldn't have to fight anymore. Let's take together. And this juice, it's amazing to me how horrible a stain blood will make on your clothes. You just can't hardly get it out. And God saw fit to use the blood of his son to wash away every stain on each of us. This blood makes us whiter than snow because of Jesus. Let's celebrate as we partake. Thank you, God, for this. And now, let's celebrate this. This is Lance Taylor. Lance came forward this morning hearing the call of God. And that's what's most important. And he's come and saying he accepted Jesus into his heart. He wants to make a new in his life. So, Lance, if you just repeat after me. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. Accept him. As my personal Lord and Savior. As my personal Lord and Savior. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, upon your profession of faith in Him, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church. Come on, church. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. Keep it going. Keep it going. 102, and there's many more. So let's get out of here. Go love God, love people. Watch him change the world. We'll see you guys.